Well, uh, I would like to address a topic of discussion that is very important in understanding the nature of government and the, the philosophy and ethics that go along with that. And that discussion centers around the, f the fact that people often use government services as a justification for the violence and coercion and the very existence of government. Um, often you'll hear the argument that, well, I, I need the roads, I need police protection, I need education, I need all these things, I need regulation, I need to make sure that my food is safe, I need to make sure that my children are safe, and so forth. And those are all things that, uh, that I want too. But I think what is not understood is uh, the nature of government. So I'm going to try to at least show you how I see it. I don't think it's subjective. I think what these things are is what they are, and if you can can uh, explain the facts of the matter, then uh, a, a better understanding can be had about these things. Um, so let's start out with the services themselves that people uh, want. These are obviously <clears throat> important things, or many of them are. The question is, is there any way to deliver services uh, to people without using coercion and violence and taxation and such from the government? And my answer is absolutely. I think if you were to look at each thing that you think that you need, you would find that there is a way that it could be done. Some things are more difficult than others, but for the most part, there is a way that just about everything that is done by the state today could be done. And, of course, if I prove that point to you, often... I'll have uh, the response, well, but people shouldn't have to pay for things if they're poor. You know, poor people should should get uh, police protection and education and and so forth. Is is the um, the argument? And I would say that uh, in a freer society where there weren't so many taxes fees and regulations, it would be a lot easier to provide things that people who are relatively poor could afford for, for starters. And for the things that poor people can't afford, there are, uh, you know, charities could handle that. Uh, I've I've had discussions with people on this matter, and they said, "Oh, that's ridiculous! It has to be required." And basically saying that it has to be required that everybody pay for such and such to make sure that poor people have enough money to do whatever it is that uh, that they feel is uh, is an essential. That <coughs> healthcare is uh, is most commonly referred to in this manner that uh, you can't just let people die, that you've got to have some sort of requirement that everybody pay for health care, because health care is expensive. And uh, health care can be expensive. However, when you start requiring people to buy stuff, and you start requiring all sorts of regulations on how stuff can be delivered that people need. You are implying that you know exactly what people need and exactly how to deliver it, and that nobody could possibly figure out 
a better way to do these things and then if they do figure out a better way if they don't meet your demands and your requirements that you will use force against them to stop them from doing what it is that they are doing so if I have some manner of uh, curing a disease let's say and I go about telling people oh I have this and it cures this disease maybe I don't have double-blind placebo-controlled studies and maybe that's not enough for a lot of people but what if it is okay with somebody don't they have the right to make that decision for themselves aren't they smart enough to make those decisions or at least have the right to make that decision for themselves without some disinterested third party telling them what they can and can't do who actually is not disinterested because there's often a financial motivation behind decisions made by government regulators because government regulators are generally former employees of the companies that they regulate or possibly future employees it almost always happens that way anybody who studies it knows it's called the revolving door phenomena and also the deeper uh, name you know concept here is called regulatory capture where a regulator which may have started out as an independent entity becomes pretty much a tool for those regulated those current market participants of any significant size to maintain their dominance in the marketplace and avoid competition from new participants <clears throat> and this is um, done all over the place via regulation they basically make it too cumbersome and difficult for new entrepreneurs to enter a market that would otherwise perhaps be very easy to enter and they do this and they act like they're doing us all a favor and protecting us but a lot of it is not and the people that suffer in the end are the poor because the poor don't have those connections they don't have the jobs that that creates the fake jobs a lot of it and ultimately they are screwed and they're made to pay higher prices for everything that they need because the government has made it so difficult to enter a marketplace that you don't have enough providers of services and therefore the price becomes too high or the government subsidizes it so much that it bids up the price so high that people can't afford it and that's kind of what happened in healthcare there's a few different reasons why it's happened in healthcare one is the licensing of doctors is a is a service uh, monopolized by the government if you want to become a doctor you must get their license even if you get other licenses as well which strictly limits the supply of doctors and this licensing paradigm also makes it so that people who are probably qualified to do the vast majority of uh, what is needed in the medical uh, services are not allowed to without a doctor somehow involved meaning that if some sort of nurse practitioner who can probably handle damn near anything you you throw at them uh, within reason were to want to do certain things they wouldn't be allowed to because of the the government's one-size-fits-all regulations well what if I as a consumer would like to go to a, a, a nurse practitioner or something let's say I can't handle something and I've cut myself open or something like that and I need to have somebody help me out well that nurse is probably trained well enough to be able to fix me and by God it's my fucking choice so if I want to go see somebody of my choosing then I should be able to do that and I should face the consequences if it was a bad choice and you know the the other thing that comes in is well there, there seems to be this implied uh, idea that the only person that can regulate is the state well I tell you that this is uh, utterly false because 
you can have private regulators that compete with each other to provide the best regulation. And that way, if a regulator starts becoming corrupt, then you can just choose not to trust their regulation any longer. You can say that if regulator A starts doing things that are shady, and there will be probably watchdog groups just like there are now who look at it, then instead of writing your damn congressman demanding that they do something and then they never do anything, which is how it works now, you simply say, I am not going to trust that regulator's uh, regulations, any longer. Their, their seal of approval. So let's say you had a doctor that was certified by some regulator and that regulator turned out to be bunk. Well, you should be a lot more questioning of that uh, doctor if, uh, if that were the case. If they were kind of like some of these, if, for instance, like they have these universities that are like, what do they call them, uh, diploma mills or something like that, where they put out diplomas just by paying them money. Well, that's a, uh, you know that that university is probably not somebody you'd want to hire somebody from unless you did a lot of, uh, you know, unless you had some sort of reputation to go by. Um, but if you had no reputation uh, to base your decision on and you wanted to use some sort of a regulator or certification of some sort, well, then you can, in advance, understand the certification and understand which are acceptable and which are not and uh, make your decision appropriately like a, uh, like a grown human being. Um, when the government uh, creates licenses and such, they take that choice away from you and they make it so only their idea of what's acceptable is is allowed and I think that's a great disservice that is done to us uh, as in our society um, so that I think in some way answers the question of why certain services are expensive and why government is demanded to to come in and uh, provide them and I think that we can pretty much dismiss this idea for for just about anything that is heavily uh, just about anything that there's a heavy amount of government involvement is going to be a lot more expensive than things that aren't and as a result if, <clears throat> if you were to take them out of the equation, I think in most cases, uh, competition would cause prices to go down to where they were affordable, and anything that was not affordable to somebody could be handled by charity, as I had said before. So, <clears throat> this moves us on to the idea that, um, the, the central point of this, uh, that government services do not justify coercion. Now, we were talking about how the state provides various uh, essential services. The assumption often is that if these services were not provided by the state that they wouldn't be provided by anyone. We can go into a couple of examples but uh, I think you'll see that that is not true. If uh, Let's take education, for example, as another example. Education was around before the state was around. We often uh, tend to think of it as an exclusively state function because the state is hugely involved in it. However, uh, there were uh, schools before the state, people were literate before the state started um, getting involved in education and requiring it. And uh, actually it was uh, a movement on the part of, I believe it was some Protestant groups in the north that wanted to have um, state-run schools because they wanted to have a more homogenous kind of population and they wanted more nationalism and have certain standards and, and so forth, but uh, but there was certainly uh, school and uh, literacy and such uh, prior to the state. And 
you know, if there was some academic talking to me, they'd be like, tr they'd be trying to get into s all sorts of like, oh, show me all the data, show me all the statistics, blah, 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 blah. You know, that's interesting to a point. But the nice thing about philosophy is you don't always have to have a bunch of damn data. And a lot of that data is going to be hugely biased in favor of the state because it will be data that is, is gathered and processed and, and shaped by people who are paid by the state who want to make it look good and who want to, you know, keep their tenure and all, you know, all this kind of crap. That's why whenever I <clears throat> discuss with somebody who uh, is, you know, a academic at a university or something, I'm always aware of this fact that they're going to be somewhat left of center at the very least because they receive a paycheck and a pension from the state. You rarely ever meet somebody who works at a state-funded institution or who works for the government who is an anarchist or who believes in freedom and, and so forth. And so they've got all sorts of little dinky arguments that they sound very suave and smart about to try to justify it. But honestly, I, I've, I've heard enough of this, I've heard enough of it, to where I realize that a lot of it is just a big waste of time. There's no way that I'm ever going to change their mind, and there's no way that they're going to change my mind. And here's why. Yes, it's nice to have the roads, it's nice to have the schools, it's nice to have the police, sometimes, unless of course they're beating you. But, if the cost of all these things mean wars, where millions of people are killed, or jails filled with people who have not committed any crimes against each other, or jails, period, which I think we can actually do without jails, and there are ways around that, too, but that will be another uh, video, then I think it's not worth it. I think that you can come up with a way of doing all these things without having to create a monopoly that abuses its power and dumbs down our kids and sends our young men and women to war and throws people in jail over things that don't cause any harm to anyone. I think that that's not an acceptable cost. I don't give a good goddamn if there's roads and schools and police and firemen as a result of all that. Because I know that we're all intelligent human beings, and we're not intelligent human beings because of the state. We are because that is who we are. And the state just exists alongside us. Of course, it affects us. But honestly, we can be who we want to be without somebody holding a gun to our fucking heads. We can be decent human beings without that. And of course, I'm not acting like some sort of uh, idealist. Because if you study, uh, well, anarcho-capitalism, which is really my philosophy, you'll see that it in no way assumes that people are going to be good to each other. Government assumes that you will uh, elect these fine individuals and that they will they will go into government and they will do the will of the people because you elected them. But that's in no way the reality. Government is often the most corrupt people or corruptible people and often they're, they and their appointees are the cause of a lot of our problems in society. Even left-wing status will rail about Monsanto and the regulator and how they never do anything about it and yet they never seem to realize that the reason there is a problem is because there's a monopoly over regulation. Duh. It's not that hard to figure out. It's just there's this mental block thinking that without the state, 
that Monsanto would take over. No. The reason why Monsanto and all these other big companies are so powerful is because of the state. They would not be able to do half of what they do. They wouldn't be able to do any of what they do, hardly, if it had it not been for the protections afforded to them by the state. The state subsidizes, protects, and enables these companies through various means, be it regulation, be it intellectual property law, be it the limit upon liability afforded to board members of companies such that they can do things that are really bad for both their company and other people without being personally liable. So the state protects all those people. Now, one, one thing you might be thinking is, but without the state, how would we resolve disputes? Because that's one of the essential services, right, that they provide. There is no reason, other than the fact that we're so used to it, that one organization must provide dispute resolution services. And in fact, it's very dangerous for one organization to provide dispute resolution services because if that, if that organization becomes corrupt, and it will, if you give it a monopoly, and it has, then it will become progressively worse and nobody will be able to resolve a dispute equitably and what will end up happening is the people with more clout and more money will have better outcomes in their disputes, which is the way it is. The people who make the most money off of our system are lawyers and well-connected businessmen and, and well-connected businessmen who can afford expensive lawyers. Um, some of the crumbs fall out and hit, you know, enough people to where they're happy with it, you know. That's part of the, the whole game, is you have to buy off enough of the common people to make them okay with it enough to where they'll police each other and that they won't revolt. And that's kind of how it works. That's why you have all these public sector employees and all their unions and all the all the uh, political machinations that go along with that, and then you also have uh, all these corporatist uh, people who make money because of essentially rents collected from the state to where the state, uh, like I had described earlier, the state creates great lucrative situations where other market, where competition is not allowed in the marketplace enough to where they can make obscene profits. This happens all over the place, particularly in industries still deemed essential. Um, and that's what screws over the poor people. Um, so, the, the thing I, I just, I keep coming back to and I keep hearing is that the state provides all these all of these services and that they are necessary uh, and and as I've said I agree that a lot of this stuff is necessary but also I think that some of it is not nearly as necessary as you might think and part of the reason why it stays around is is not because people necessarily want or need it but because the state puts it there um, there's so many examples where I could could go into that, but, uh, you know, roads, for example. You know, maybe roads aren't the best way to move people and items around. Maybe they create a situation where people live too spaced out, to where they end up having to buy cars and, and things like that in order to, to move around, to where there's no mass transit. And actually, if you research uh, the history of roads and uh, cities, you'll find that the state is a large part of the reason, possibly, you know, with connections to big automakers and such, but it was not possible without the state. Uh, that, uh, that we don't all just uh, walk over to the nearest train and uh, go where we need to go. I know in my city it's impossible. There's a shuttle bus thing, but it's really inefficient and really hard to, uh, 
you know, to get to where you need to go with it. There's a lot of places you can't go with it. But, uh, point being, um, if there are things that the state is funding and creating that are not truly necessary, it's basically, in a way, kind of fossilizing that situation. It's basically making it so uh, we're going to continue using outmoded means of running our society. Uh, as long as the state continues to create schools, uh, yeah, you may have a certain baseline of, of individuals, but that is going to continue to degrade because uh, their system is crumbling. And they're, they're trying all these ways that have never worked to try to reform it. They're always, my whole life I've heard about, oh, education reform, oh, more money, education reform. It doesn't seem to be making much of a difference doesn't seem to matter how much money they put into it or how much reform and it's not that the teachers are bad or that or anything like that necessarily although a lot of them probably are it's more that um, the whole system is simply flawed it's good people in a bad system is a lot of it and when you put good people in a bad system it's not good for the good people and it's not good for the people subjected to the whims and, and will of that system meaning children who have no say in society uh, and are forced at gunpoint to, when it comes down to it to go to school uh, you can uh, force somebody to go to school but that doesn't mean they're going to learn and that doesn't mean that they're going to learn in the best way and that's just the bottom line when it comes down to it there's, there have been schools in uh, in England actually uh, quite some time ago. They uh, they used to have these schools where kids would basically uh, even poor children uh, would go to these schools and they would kind of mentor each other. Like the older children would mentor the younger children and they would basically it would basically be kind of like a marketplace within the school for the teaching services and there would be uh, a lot of kids helping each other out which cut down drastically on personnel costs and uh, there was a focus on uh, entrepreneurship and as a result those kids got out of school uh, knowing how to make a living which is more than I can tell more than I can say for the kids that come out of the public schools, a lot of them end up just working. Uh, if they if they stop at at the uh, high school level, they generally will end up just working. Uh, if if they're lucky, they might find a decent job, but for the most part, they're they're stuck working um, close to minimum wage jobs, and never really making much money or having much success. Some of them are sure able to break out and start a business or or uh, go to school or you know go to uh, college and uh, receive a professional degree and uh, that's nice to some extent but you know I know from my own experience a professional degree while yeah it shows that you've been through a lot and that you were able to learn a lot it doesn't necessarily mean that you know anything of use and that you can actually especially in today's world you can do quite a lot of things without ever getting a professional degree. You can even go and work in positions alongside professionals without having such a degree. Uh, there's certain areas where that's going to be virtually impossible, but you know, there's a lot of areas where it is. So, I think I've pretty well uh, covered what I intended to say here. Um, that you know there's a lot of things that we think we need in society that were they not provided by the state would be provided much better by the private sector because there would be choices and because things that don't work would go away they wouldn't stay around year after year and you'd have direct control over it you'd be able to if you didn't want your kid to go to such and such school you could send them to another school you wouldn't be like having to send them to some school because you live in a certain spot and and so forth 
And you know, one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that markets uh, regulate themselves. Yes, they do. They regulate themselves. And anything that can't be regulated by purely um, consumer action or uh, or prices and things like that can be regulated by you know dispute resolution organizations and insurance companies and and things of that sort who will compete with each other and will provide choices and you know I only pay fifty uh, to fifty some odd dollars for my auto insurance I only pay fifty uh, something like seventy bucks uh, to uh, insure my house from burning down but my health I've got to pay you know I'm not even sure how much it is it's over a thousand dollars a month and if anybody thinks that that would be that expensive in a free market they gotta be kidding themselves because in a free market health insurance would not be anything like what it is now so given all these things and the fact that the many of the services are better provided by the free market I can't really think that there's any excuses left as for why anyone should be allowed to initiate force on another person to achieve some sort of objective the nobility of all these uh, things that are said to be needed has in my opinion been called into question and shown to be a, a false kind of a false sense of nobility it's a false kind of, of altruism you know you want something for the poor but you're in the process destroying the poor's chance of, of ever being able to take their own destiny in their hands I think that's a crime I don't care if people do it every day if it's done all over society I think it's a fucking crime. People need to be able to make their own choices. They need to be able to do so without somebody standing on over them with a gun. And they need to be able to keep the fruits of their labors. If you don't have those things, you don't have a free society. And if you care anything about freedom, then you need to think twice before supporting things such as taxation and coercion from the government and prisons and other sort of forms of violence like war because these things gobble up a lot of people's lives they kill a lot of innocent people and even though you may not be able to stop them you can at least do what you can to not support them and to raise awareness of these kind of philosophies to where maybe you'll inspire somebody else not to support it and they'll inspire somebody else and who knows maybe at some point enough people will understand this to where they don't just implicitly think automatically that because they want a road that somebody has to be held at gunpoint to have these things. And let me explain one more thing. Since we're talking, since coercion and violence are one of the main uh, objectives to discuss here, or the main uh, points to discuss here, I uh, have heard, had people tell me that, uh, that it's ridiculous to get upset about this tax stuff, that it's not nearly as bad or, as I say it is. Then I'm blowing it out of proportion. Well, you know, I certainly uh, understand how they can see how they can see it that way. Uh, they see it as basically a payment for services, as they're filling out some stupid form, and then as long as they fill it out accurately, that they'll be fine. But what if you don't? Or what if they determine that you made a mistake? Or what if you don't have the money? What happens then? Well, it's a very simple chain of events. You get a letter, 
And I've got I've had this happen before myself on one occasion. You get a letter in the mail, and they tell you you owe them money, and you should prove why you don't own the money if you happen to think that you don't. If you can't come up with proof satisfactory to their to their liking, they will send you another letter and maybe another. The letters are going to get shorter and a little bit more drastic in their statements. And then you might get an invitation to come and see them. And let's say you do or don't go and see them, eventually it's going to come down to a situation where you're either going to have to go and turn yourself in to them and and be subject to their will, possibly have all your assets taken and be put into a prison, or somebody's going to knock at your door and they're going to demand that you come with them. If you don't come with them, they will subdue you by force. If you try to defend yourself, you will be shot, tased, beaten, and if they get you into their custody, they'll put you into their system, subject you to their arbitrary will, possibly throw you in a cage for a amount of time of their choosing, depending on what they feel like and whoever you happen to deal with. And then when you're out, society has all these ways of screwing you over for the rest of your life because you are a felon even though you haven't done anything to actually harm another human being warranting such ostracism. Now, if somebody thinks that that's okay, then I don't know what I can say to them. Because there are a lot better ways to solve problems than by using those kinds of threats. A lot of these things are simply accounting problems. If you're worried about paying for the roads, come up with some way, maybe even similar to the way it is right now, where maybe the gas stations pay for the roads. It's kind of that way right now, you know, in a manner of speaking, except the government still monopolizes it. And I'm sure there's a lot of waste there, and there's a lot of roads built that don't need to be built. Maybe the gas stations run some of the roads, maybe a lot of the roads could be toll roads, maybe the road outside of your, the roads in your subdivision could be roads that uh, are built when the subdivision comes in, and you can agree when you move in to pay a, a yearly fee, you know, something like that. At least it would be something you agreed to. Uh, to say that you agreed to something by being born, or by living in a particular hemisphere and it's on a particular continent between a certain parallel, that's uh, a bit excessive. Uh, you have to be able to really exercise proper, you know, property rights if you're going to be able to tell somebody what to do in a certain area. You can't just say, oh, everything from the Atlantic to the Pacific, north of this parallel and south of this parallel. That's kind of excessive. That's not property. That's a territorial monopoly. Property is something altogether different. It's something that you maintain actively, yourself or your agents. And there is no way that one could say that the US government maintains all of the land, or any government for that matter, maintains all the land that it claims as its own. So, I hope that uh, if you were unfamiliar with these ideas, or on the fence, or uh, even agreed that you understand a little better now why it's important to think twice before asking for laws, before asking for taxes, before asking for regulations. These things are not as effective as they're often described as being. They're unethical, 
to, you know, it's unethical to do certain things. Like, you know, if it's unethical for me to initiate violence against you to achieve a goal of mine, and it's no more ethical for a group of people to get together and vote on something and say that they can then initiate violence on us, us, other people. Uh, we have to start applying morality, the morality that we use at the individual level, to larger scale aspects of our society. And I think a lot of our problems will go away. I'm not saying it's a panacea. I'm not saying it's a fix-all. You still have certain aspects of human nature to deal with. Um, a lot of problems would still be there. But you've got to start somewhere. And reforming and passing laws and taxing and financing with, with deficit spending and all of these things clearly is not working eventually we're going to have to try something else that does work the only way we're going to get to where we can try things that do work is for people to change their philosophies for people to change what they think is acceptable and ethical to where the idea of Barack Obama or George Bush or somebody passing some law and initiating force on people and taking their money and telling them what to do becomes something laughable that people would say that's preposterous I'll have nothing to do with it and I'll do nothing to support it and when enough people say that something is preposterous that thing becomes a thing of the past and I can give you an example and that it would be uh, slavery and a lot of the things that have happened with uh, women you know women used to be unable to um, to really do much other than uh, their their traditional roles. Um, well, I think those traditional roles are valuable, and that it would be great if uh, if a lot of women were to you know raise their children uh, and and so forth. I also support the possibility that some may not want to do that and may want to to work and do other things. I don't think anybody ought to be standing in their way. Well, it wasn't up until relatively recently that a lot of those barriers were broken down. And while many may argue that uh, there's still a lot of barriers, and I'm sure there are to some extent, a lot of most of it is gone. And really, a lot of the things that are creating any sort of inequality could perhaps of course, I can't give you some academic paper on it, but it could perhaps be attributable to uh, the fact that men and women are different and that women often do need to raise their children, uh, that that's more their responsibility as far as being closely uh, associated with their children than it is for men, and that's been that way for thousands of years, probably forever, as far as humanity is concerned. But I think I will leave it at that. Um, I think this subject has been covered, and uh, there's lots of little things we could could delve into in the future. Uh, basically, voluntary interaction is the best. We need to encourage it wherever we can. We need to do it in our own lives, and that's where it starts. It starts in your own life. Starts in your own family. Talk to your family, to your loved ones, philosophize with them, discuss ethics, discuss reason, discuss things that are important to you, and uh, don't use violence to solve your problems. That's That solves a lot of your, even if there is a state and a lot of things that suck in the world, you can at least make your little part of the world suck a little bit less. So that's all I really have for you today.